Uh, thanks everyone for coming to my talk, the UI Artist Survival Kit. My name is Ren Breyer. Uh, I should probably start my timer. My name is Ren Breyer. I'm a senior artist at Well Placed Cactus, a former artist at um, Half Brick on Jetpack Joyride, and one of MCV Pacific's top 30 women in games uh, of this year. Um, I love UI. Uh, user interface is how your player interacts with your game and how your game conveys information to your player. It's a crucial part of every game, um, but a lot of people don't even notice it, like, kind of like audio, they only notice it when it's bad. Um, creating it is, is really challenging and interesting and requires a lot of collaboration uh, with other disciplines, which is why I love it. It's, it's very complex. Now, what this talk is not about is how to make good UI art. I'm not going to tell you how to make uh, nice layouts or pretty buttons or make juicy animations. Uh, what this talk is about is how to have a good process for making UI that is uh, helpful for game dev in general. Um, by the way, I use Photoshop, and in this talk I'll talk about Photoshop tools, but these tools generally uh, exist in, in a variety of programs to, to some degree. And uh, if you use, say, Illustrator, you'll have mostly all the same tools, and if you use, say, Sketch, you'll have some of these. Uh, but the process and the general spirit of uh, what I want to tell you would still apply. So. My basic process when I make UI is uh, first I make a flowchart, or in this case, I didn't make the flowchart, someone else made it. Um, this is a flowchart for um, Rebound. It's a game I'm currently working on at uh, Well Placed Cactus. Uh, so our designer made this flowchart, and we make sure that all of our screens connect to each other, that you can't get like stuck on a screen, um, and that all of the information that we want is conveyed. Once that's done, we make wireframes. So we usually start them, well, I usually start them on, um, on sticky notes because they're small and uh, they limit me from going into too much detail. Uh, so that's very easy to do. Um, so I do this for all of the, uh, all of the wireframes. I do them on uh, sticky notes first. Once they're all done and I'm happy with them, I take them into Photoshop. Now, usually my wireframes are just black and white with all circles and squares and, and triangles. In this case, I've got some colors. Uh, that's because this game is very color dependent, like the gameplay requires color. So um, I had some of the, the design, uh, the color design of the game already predetermined, and I wanted to incorporate that into the UI while I was uh, wireframing it. Uh, and once I'm done with all of that, I refine the art until it looks like what uh, I imagine a screenshot of the finished game to, to look like. Um, and then I export all of the individual assets from my mockups, and they can go into the game. So what's my problem with this process? It's very linear. It's, uh, you know, it's three steps. That's, that's not really how game dev works. You don't like make a thing and then just chip it. You iterate, you test and you iterate, and that's how design in general works. Um, collaboration also requires iteration. It, this, this process, I don't feel like it really encompasses what I need to do. So let me show you some examples of how it can be a problem. So let's say I have 20 screens in my game. Uh, which, which I do, roughly 20. Um, many of them have several different states, which brings the number up to like 60. Um, and between all of them, I have something like 100 assets. And that's, that's a lot of things to keep track of. If I make one change, because let's say I start with um, this play button that's super basic, um, and I put it into the game, I put it into the game as it is uh, first. I don't uh, wait until it's perfect to get it in the game. So I put it into a game like this, and it's all in all my mockups like this. And then I uh, make the 
changes to it, like to make it a bit nicer. And it needs to go in the game again. It also needs to go in all of my mockups that have the play button, which are like, I don't know, 10 of my mockups have this button. Um, and then later I update the button again because I was not happy with certain little aspects of it. And then I need to you know, export it again, update it everywhere again. And it's really easy to lose track of this stuff. I mean, it's pretty minor changes between these two buttons, for example. So I might end up with uh, the wrong asset in, in the final game. And if things go really bad, uh, everything, all of my mockups will end up being not uh, relevant to the actual game. And that's not what you want. Um, like this, this matters because it just means there's gonna be a very high chance of making mistakes. Uh, first of all, it's not just you working on this game, most likely. Other people are gonna be looking at these mockups and think that something should go somewhere um, where it doesn't or you know that they might put in the wrong asset. Uh, and even if it's just you working on this, you might not remember what you decided about your mockups uh, six months ago and didn't write down. Um, and it's harder to see the big picture if you don't have like a sort of roadmap of what you want everything to look like. Um, also, if you wanna say make an update to your game later and you've got out of date mockups, you gotta redo all your mockups to to be able to, to do anything to them. So then there's device hell. Now this is an obvious exaggeration, like nobody's gonna be making games for the iPhone 3 anymore. But uh, this is just to give a general perspective, like you are probably going to make games for uh, the iPhone 6 and the iPhone 6 Plus and the iPad and maybe your game is also going to be on PC or Apple TV, like it's going to go on multiple resolutions, uh, quite likely. Um, and if you don't take that into account while designing, your design is not going to look as good as it could. Um, so you actually need to make mockups for these different resolutions. And that's, that's doubling or even tripling your mockups. And while you're working on something on PC, uh, or Mac, depends, um, it might look good to you. But once you test it on device, it might be a bit unreadable or your buttons are too small to click on a, on a smaller device. And then exporting. Exporting can be a total nightmare. So again, I have over 100 assets um, and I update them at every stage of my UI process. And uh, it, it can be so easy to lose track of which ones are, are the most recent and which ones I've already exported, which ones I haven't. Um, yeah, it, it can be a nightmare. So let's, let's start dealing with all of these issues. Uh, I have five rules for making good mockups. So they have to be readable. That means uh, easy to view and easy to understand. They need to be changeable. So easy to iterate on, fix mistakes, uh, collaborate with people. Um, they need to be relevant, so always accurate to your final result. And they need to be testable, so you wanna be able to test the design as much as possible at the earliest stages. And finally, they need to be usable. So I don't like making mockups that are just concept art when, when I'm doing um, UI mockups they need to be what I can actually put in the final game. I want to be able to export the assets straight out of my mockups. So I want the shortest possible journey between making this concept and being able to export assets out of it. So I use a lot of different tools for um, achieving these, uh, these goals in my rules. Um, I'm gonna show you some of them. So that's artboards, device preview, proof setup, smart objects, Adobe libraries and generate image assets. So if you're familiar with any of these, that's awesome. I hope I can still teach you something new about them. Um, and if not, if you're not familiar with some of them or any of them, well, even better, you'll learn more. So let's start with artboards. Artboards are uh, a bunch of canvases in the one Photoshop file. Uh, who here is uh, familiar with artboards? Nice. So uh, you'd want to use them because they give you a good overview of all of your mockups in the game. They're just a nice roadmap. Uh, they reduce file messiness, so you have far fewer um, 
uh, files that your project is spread across. Uh, it's really easy to make changes across screens, and I'll show you in a moment how. Uh, and you can work on multiple resolutions. So this game, Rebound, uh, is um, iPhone only, so I didn't need to do this. But uh, if this game was also for uh, other devices, say iPad, I could have both the iOS and the iPad's um, artboards on the same screen, on the, on the same um, Photoshop file, sorry. So let's see, this is the first video. So excuse any gaffes. All right. So these are my artboards. And you can see them, hopefully you can see them, in the layers over there. Oops. Yeah. Yeah, over there in the, in the layers panel. Um, they, they contain the, the layers that are in each artboard or the layer groups. Now, I've got this, uh, oops, this missions um, panel over there. Like, it's this here. This is the, um, uh, these are the missions um, in our game. So I can just drag that folder that has the missions in it into the next artboard. Um, and it, it goes into the correct spot. I can also alt drag it and then it duplicates it into the correct spot. And that can be really useful for something, say, like if you have a back button, that's always in the same spot on all of your screens, as I think it should be. Um, it's, uh, you, you don't have to like move it into position every time, it just goes straight where it needs to go. So that's alt dragging between uh, layers, I mean, between artboards in the layers area. So this is how you make a new um, file with artboards. Um, Photoshop, uh, this is Photoshop CC, by the way. Um, so you can just choose whatever uh, device and resolution you're making uh, your uh, mockups for. So in this case, I go with iPhone 6 Plus, and just make sure that your artboards option over there is ticked. And that makes an artboard. So I'll just go back to the uh, my other file. Here we go. So the artboard tool uh, lives over here in the top corner under the, um, the move tool. So if you uh, click and hold it, you can get to this tool. Uh, you can also get to it by clicking on any of the titles of your artboards. And that causes these little pluses to show up. So if you click on one of these pluses, it uh, creates a new artboard like that. But what's even better is if you alt click it, it duplicates your artboard. <laughs> I can hear like oohs and ahs. Yeah, I, I was really happy when I discovered that. <laughs> Saves you a lot of trouble. Um, so let's say I want to make uh, an iPad version of this screen. I can just duplicate it. And then here at the top of um, the artboard tool, I can just change the size from iPhone 6 Plus to uh, iPad Retina. and it makes it that size. Now, I still need to uh, edit it myself, but it only takes me like a couple minutes to get it from this state to uh, being the correct resolution. So, my tips for artboards are name your canvases, make sure they have reasonable names that communicate uh, what they're for. Um, uh, don't forget you can alt click the pluses to duplicate uh, an artboard, and you can alt drag your layers between artboards to duplicate them in the, into the correct spot. Um, you can use the artboard tool to uh, change your canvas size, and uh, this is just how I do this. This is my advice for um, when you've got a game with you know a lot, a lot of screens, which you, is probably most games. Um, start with one file and. Uh, as you start working on it and uh, expand on it and expand on it, it eventually will start chugging. So uh, maybe when you sense that it's starting to do that, split it up into a few files. So I think in the end with Rebound, I ended up with something like six, um, with yeah, something like 60 screens between them. Uh, so device preview. Uh, who here um, uses device preview? 
Cool. So it's, um, yeah, it's a, an official iOS app for uh, previewing your design on uh, iPhone or iPad. It's uh, really great. Um, you just download it on your phone and then you can test your designs. Uh, you don't need to export or anything. It automatically shows you what, you, uh, what you're working on as you work on it. Um, every time you make a change, it updates. Um, you can, it, it works really great with artboards. This is, by the way, something that I really like about um, these tools that I'm showing you is that they all work together really nicely. Um, so you can navigate between your artboards. There's like a little main menu that you can, uh, you can click to see the artboards and you can even just swipe between them. Um, and this is something that I haven't tried yet, but I have read about and sounds great. Uh, if you have a, a Photoshop file that has um, canvases of uh, multiple different resolutions, it'll only show them, it'll only show you the canvases that are relevant to your device that you're using. So if you've got, uh, if you're using an iPhone, it will only show you the iPhone canvases and not the iPad ones. Oh, uh, one more thing. This is iOS only, unfortunately, and it's, it can be a little finicky to set up the first time. Don't give up, it's worthwhile. Proof setup. So who uses proof setup? Nice, one person, no, two people, yeah. Um, so proof setup, you, usually you would have encountered it if you pressed control Y trying to redo a thing and found out that it's the wrong shortcut. Uh, or you'd know of it if you wanted to preview things for printing, but it's actually useful for a lot more things. So it's a tool, it's a general tool for previewing how your designs look in different color spaces or, or on different kinds of devices. Um, it can show you what your image looks like in grayscale. So this is what my game looks like in grayscale. It's really good for checking contrast like that. And it can show you what your image looks like to colorblind people, which is very good for accessibility. So. The reason I'd prefer this over other metho methods of um, checking how things look in grayscale is because it's very quick and very non-destructive. So it's just a click of a button, turn on and turn off with uh, control Y. And uh, yeah, it doesn't require you merging any layers or, or like hiding and showing layers. It's just the easiest thing to do. Um, good contrast is very important if you want your game to be readable, which of course you do. Um, it's more important, like readability in grayscale is more important than readability in color. So that's uh, something that I think you should always check about your designs. And finally, yeah, you would want to improve accessibility to your game because why wouldn't you want more players? So this is what the game looks like normally and this is what it looks like to uh, certain colorblind people. Uh, it's very different and very cool. <laughs> um, when I first started on this game, it used, a, it used very slightly different colors to these and um, I checked how it looked uh, to colorblind people and uh, you couldn't tell apart two of these colors. So uh, that was one of the first changes I made when I uh, joined the team. Now, I just gotta say that, yeah, not all colorblind people are the same and uh, Photoshop can help you look at two different types of colorblind people, like the two most uh, common ones. Uh, there are others. I am not super sure if uh, there exist color profiles like by default in Photoshop for checking that. Um, if not, I'm sure this is something that, you, that someone has, uh, has made and you could probably download. Um, so I just have a quick video for this one. There's my mouse. Here we go. So here I'm just going control Y and turning it grayscale. That's how easy it is. Um, then I can just go into view, proof setup and uh, color blindness. Um, so there's, there's two types there. So I just, I chose one of them. I'm sorry, I am not going to try to pronounce the names. They are medical and complicated sounding. Um, and then here I'm switching to the other one. There we go, protonopia and do, do something, yeah. So, oh, sorry, it's uh, jumped back. There we go. Um, oh, technical troubles. Here we go, okay, it's playing. So if I wanna make the grayscale, uh, if, if I wanna test grayscale, that's not available by default, um, but you can just go into custom, so view, 
um, and some like proofing and then custom. And then uh, you just pick from in proof conditions, device to simulate. You just pick the very last one, S gray, and then uh, press save so that you can access it easily in the future. I just call it grayscale. And then it's uh, now available to you in the view menu. And you can change to it with uh, control Y. So again, I would suggest uh, saving this proof setup so that you can access it easily and uh, use it all the time. Um, test often. You don't want to find out after you've finished your game and making your game that your contrast is really terrible or that colorblind people can't play it. And uh, use multiple fr proofing setups. So uh, check for colorblindness, check uh, grayscale. You might have other things that are relevant to you to test uh, for your specific game. Smart objects. Uh, who here, wait, I've got the wrong view here. Who here uses smart objects? Good. <laughs> if you don't, don't worry, you'll learn. So a smart object is basically a reference to a source image uh, that you put into your canvas. Uh, what I've got here is, um, uh, here under this image is, um, is uh, what it looks like in, um, in your layers. It's got that little icon there. So why would you want to use this? Well, it lets you edit things non-destructively. So you can edit each um, copy, each reference essentially of, uh, of your source image individually and do whatever you want to it. And uh, the source file is always, uh, always safe. It, it's always, uh, how it always how it was from the beginning. Um, you can edit the source to update every copy. So uh, for example here I've got this play button and it's on four different screens. Um, and if like I showed you at the start it, it started off as uh, just a basic circle with a triangle in it and I slowly fleshed it out to be better and uh, more detailed. Um, every time I made those changes it updated it in every copy on, on every screen. Um, it works really well with libraries, which is the next tool I'm going to show you. Um, and it allows scaling of layer effects. So what does that mean? Well, let's say you've got a, you've got a circle and it's got a stroke around it and the stroke is 10 pixels. And then you shrink it down to a very small size and the stroke is still going to be 10 pixels. Uh, and with a tiny circle, maybe you don't want the 10 uh, pixel stroke, you want it to be relative to the circle size. So if you give it a stroke and then make it a smart object and then shrink it, uh, the layer effects will shrink with it, the stroke will shrink with it. Uh, sometimes that's what you want, but sometimes it's not what you want. So you then do the effect on the smart object like outside of it, and then um, it won't scale the layer effect. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this little blue guy, I'm gonna turn him on and off here. He's in a, a layer folder. I just right click it and uh, convert it to smart object. Now it's a smart object. And if I click on the little image next to the layer, I can go into the smart object. And then I can make changes to it, save, and it updates in all of the reference images. Um, I can make changes to this so like I can make it really small and then make it big again. And unlike a, a regular raster image, it's not going to lose uh, quality because the original image has not been affected. Um, so, oh, and um, yeah, you can distort it as well. You can do all kinds of things to it. Um, it's actually, Photoshop has really versatile editing tools for, um, for smart objects. And then if I go back to my original image, it's still like it was. So I'll just revert this. There we go. So I can just duplicate this. And now it's another instance of, uh, of the same object. If I make changes to it, it does that in, uh, in all of the copies.
Oh, um, something to note is uh, up here at the top, it shows you, it might be kind of hard to see. I'll just wait until I transform it again here. Um, just give it a sec. Make it smaller. Here we go. So up there, you'll see uh, it's got a height and width. Is that readable at all? OK. Um, so it's got a height and width. And uh, by default, it's 100%. But uh, it, this height and width is uh, relative not to your instance, but to the source material. So if I resize this instance to, say, 30%, and then um, I wanted to resize it again later and I come back to it, it will still say 30% um, because it's, the source file size has not changed. So it's uh, relative to that. Whereas normally if you edit, like just resize something in Photoshop, it will, um, the new size that you make it will now become the 100%. So that's not the case here. So I'm just gonna resize it here to fit that little bubble. And then, <coughs> I can just, uh, where's that layer? Yeah, I can just drag that layer. Oh, I'm gonna rename it first. That's also important. Um, make sure your layers don't have stupid names like copy, copy, copy. <laughs> um, and then you can drag them between, uh, alt drag them between uh, your artboards and uh, they all show up in the correct spot. And they're all instances, so anytime you make changes to, uh, to one of them, it'll change it in all of them, in all of your artboards. Oh, so another thing. Ah, oh, snap. Um, yeah. Okay, so I can do a, a new smart object via copy. So that's different to just copying a smart object. This is weird, confusing terminology, but new smart object via copy makes uh, a copy of the, of the source material rather than the instance. So now you have a new source material that's being referenced by a new smart object. I mean, by a new um, instance. So if I go into this one and I make changes to it, and go back, it only changes that one. And it'll change any copies of that one as well. Um, it's just, it's now a separate uh, smart object, but this is really handy if say you've got uh, a bunch of buttons that are similar, but not quite the same. You want them to have uh, the same sort of base, but you don't need them to, you know, you don't want all of the buttons to change. You only want like a certain subset of them to change. Yeah, that's, that's smart objects. Um, so to reiterate, you can duplicate them between artboards. Again, this works really well with artboards. Um, uh, oh, try not to nest objects, um, <coughs> to nest smart objects. So you can put a smart object in a smart object in a smart object. I don't recommend it um, because when you get to slightly more advanced uh, ways of dealing with smart objects, like having uh, linked smart objects or putting them in libraries, it starts to not work so well, like they don't update and stuff like that. Uh, make your smart objects big. Um, your smart object instance is only as good as the uh, source material it's based off of. So if uh, you wanna make your object bigger, the original has to be big enough to allow for that. And then again, new smart object via copy, uh, very handy. Photoshop libraries. <laughs> so who uses Photoshop libraries? Cool. Good job, guys. <laughs> um, Photoshop libraries uh, are a web service. Um, it's a, another cloud service. It allows you to organize your assets. Um, it's a bit more than just asset storage. It, it can be really, really useful. Um, so why would you want to use this? Well, you can organize your smart objects. It essentially makes them uh, into linked smart objects, uh, but they're special linked smart objects that live in your libraries. So linked smart objects are smart objects that you can use across uh, multiple Photoshop files. Normally a smart object is embedded inside your Photoshop file and is only tied to that one Photoshop file. 
But with linked smart objects, they can be used across any Photoshop file you want. They just, usually they live somewhere on your computer. So here instead they live on the cloud. Um, and they show up in this handy dandy little menu that's uh, in your sidebar. Um, so yeah, you can use them all uh, across all your project files. Um, and you can save not just your smart objects, but also uh, color swatches and layer effects and uh, text um, settings, all kinds of things. And you can apply those things just by uh, being on the correct layer and clicking them. Um, it allows you to work easily across computers. So me personally, I work both from home and from an office. And uh, it means that I always have all of my uh, smart objects and, and my swatches and all that on uh, all my computers instead of having to set them individually on, on each computer and keep saving them across um, and sending them to myself. And it can be used with other uh, CC programs. So you can use these in Illustrator. You can use them in uh, InDesign, uh, After Effects, uh, just a whole bunch of programs. Um, it's, Really, really useful. Okay. So here's an empty library. By the way, you can have multiple libraries. Uh, so this is how I put things into it. I'll start this one over actually. So I can just, uh, I'm, I'm on a particular layer. I'm on the star layer. It's the, this one over here. Um, and I can just click that little plus button at the bottom of libraries and uh, it asks me, that went way too fast. Yeah, here we go. So it asks me if I want uh, to import a graphic. So a graphic is a content of the layer that you're on or uh, in this case, the foreground color. So the foreground color that I'm currently using. Um, so in this case, I just wanted to add the, uh, the layer. And then, yeah, now it's a, it was a smart object before. And uh, now it's a linked smart object. So you see it's got a little cloud next to it. Um, and if I made any changes to it, so like in this case, I made it white, uh, it's updated in every instance of that object. If I had this one on another um, canvas, it would update there as well. So in this case, ah, uh, give me a sec. The pause button keeps disappearing if I don't move my mouse. Okay, so I switched to a text layer and then I press the plus button and now it gives me more options. So I can save the, um, the graphic, so the content of the layer. I can also save the character style because um, it's, a, it's a text layer. And I can save the text color. So I'm like, sure, why not? I want all of these things. So I save all of them. And they're split nicely by category like this. So um, this is my text. It's white, so it's a bit hard to see. Let's make it red. And then I save it and I go back and oh, it's not red. Why is it not red? It's because this was a text layer and not a smart object. So, um, if you want your smart object to, uh, if, if you want this text layer to become a smart object, a link smart object, uh, you turn it into a smart object and then you right click, relink to library graphic. So I can click that, relink, and now it's updated. And now if I go back here and change it back to white, which by the way here, I can do that with just the click of the, switch, uh, of the swatch, um, it's updated here. Um, let's see. You can also just drag layers into there if you want to save the graphics. I find the dragging a little finicky a lot of the time because uh, what it will do if I have a lot of layers is I start dragging it and it'll start dragging it up inside the layer panel. Super annoying. Um, so I find the little plus button works better. But if you don't have a lot of layers, then it's fine. Um, so placing them from the library, you just drag them out of the library and put them into, into your game. Um, and they show up as, uh, as linked smart objects. Uh, and now I'm gonna open up a new uh, Photoshop file and I can put these um, smart objects here too. And if I made any changes to them here, they'll update in my other document as well. See? 
So I'm just gonna fix this back up again. And I think the next thing I'm doing here is clean up a little, because I've got all these useless layers. Okay. So another thing I can do is place layers. So when you just click and drag it, it chooses place linked, this option here. But uh, if you wanna, if you, if you click press layers, I mean, sorry, place layers. Oh no, sorry, I'm showing you press link, place linked again. Yeah, place layers on the other hand, um, puts it in as uh, all of the layers that were in the smart object. So again, this is useful if I want to make, let's say, a new object, or just I want to use those layers for whatever reason and not affect um, any other object. I can also just duplicate this and then work on the new one, but I, I find this sort of workflow works better for me. Um, yeah, so this guy, I can individually, I can, I can take its individual layers. I, I tend to put them into, um, into a layer folder if, I, um, if they aren't already in one, otherwise things can get a little messy. Um, oh, so make sure that your objects in your libraries are named uh, intelligently, like that one was just called, you know, 1035, and that's, that doesn't really tell me the function of that, so I changed it to um, start counter. So, my tips, put every one of your assets in a library, um, at least any asset that you're going to use between screens. Um, it, it'll just make your life so much easier. Um, give everything good names. And uh, remember that you can uh, place linked or place layers. Generate image assets. This one is my favorite. Who is familiar with generate, generate image assets? Cool. I am so glad I can teach everyone else about this beautiful tool that I love so much. Um, so this is real-time asset generation. So you instantly export your assets as you're working on them and update them every time that you make any changes to them. So this, why would you want to use this? It exports your layers as, uh, as sorry, it exports your layers or layer groups as assets. So you just name your layer like, um, I don't know, back button dot PNG, and it saves it out as uh, back button dot PNG. Um, you don't even need to hit the save button. It automatically does it. Uh, it updates constantly. So as soon as you make a change to this back button, like do a brush stroke or anything, it will update your asset and it will save so much time. So much time. I can't iterate how much time this is going to save you. Okay. So let me show you how to use this. Oops. Here we go. So, um, this tool is just hidden away here under File, Generate, Image Assets. Usually it's unticked, you just gotta tick it and it activates this feature. Um, so I already had it ticked and it saved um, every asset that I had here that's named something.png into uh, this folder here. So my file is called uh, screen mockups game loop.psd. So anything that's in uh, uh, anything that's in here is saved to screen mockups game loop assets. It's a folder that lives where this file lives. Um, so they're all in here. <coughs> Sorry, I need some water. All right. Um, so I made this little layer here, test, um, and now I name it <coughs> test.png. I go to that folder and it's already here. 
Now I can go here and I can actually give it some more information. Oh, no, sorry, I'm just going to make a change to it first. So I gave it a gradient and now it's got a gradient. So now I can, I can give the export a bit more information. So what if I want this, say, oops, to be at, um, what did I put here? Like, I think it's like 30% so, or 50%. Now it's smaller. Saves it out at 50% of its original size. Or I can even say, uh, por que no los dos? And uh, give it two names. So I can call it uh, tests, um, test 2 x uh, png and comma 50% uh, text uh, uh, test.png. And now it exports two files, one at full size and one at half size. And they just, just make sure that they've got different names. Otherwise, it'll give you an error. <clears throat> the error messages, by the way, are pretty non-invasive. It just won't export correctly, and then it'll have like a text file in the folder where it exported to that says errors, and it will tell you what the errors were. And usually it's like, can't have these two files with the same name. I mean, yeah, there was more than one, so we saved out just one. So now I'm going to just bring it back to uh, test.png. Now, um, I was hiding this before, but I actually have this empty layer here that's not inside any of my um, artboards. It's called uh, default, um, lowercase d, that's important. It's very finicky, so got to call it lowercase d default. Um, and that's your uh, layer that tells, it tells your file the default export settings for every layer that you, that you name, like uh, uh, .png, .jpeg, etc. So in this case, I wanted to define um, the default setting for it to be uh, a particular location that it saves to. So I didn't want it to be saving into my art working folder. I wanted to save straight to the repo. So it goes straight into my assets. Someone here looks very happy about this. <laughs> the front. <laughs> um, so uh, you can use um, uh, absolute um, uh, locations or you can uh, use relative ones so if you want to save it to a repo you got to use an absolute one by the way I'm running a little long sorry about this um, this is the last tool that I'm showing you um, so it's, it's this long URL you got to make sure that you enter it right um, with the correct um, uh, what's the word um, forward slash and not not a backslash and that sort of thing so now I've got this new folder that it saves it to that's inside my, um, my repo. And it's the uh, first time you do it, it might take a little bit of time because it's saving a lot. But after that, anytime you make a change, it'll be very quick. Um, you can make more changes to it with, uh, keeps doing that. Um, all right, sorry about that. Okay, yeah. So you, you can make, you can define other things like size and uh, like quality and, and other stuff. I won't go into all of it. So you can also very usefully export your mockups themselves. So the artboards themselves. Um, ah, it's, this video player is finicky. So what I like to do is save out all my mockups to a UI references folder inside the repo so that uh, whoever's putting them, uh, putting together the UI in the game can uh, use these as references. So I don't even have to save out my mockups, uh, they just export automatically. So it, you may notice I saved them as like 35% uh, references slash main menu.png. So it saves it to a subfolder of this uh, absolute uh, location at 35%. Now, you don't have to remember all of this. You don't have to remember um, the exact naming convention at once because there's a nice add-on that you can get from um, the Photoshop add-on store. You can get it for free. Um, and it just lets you define these things for a layer, like the suffix, quality, um, folder, scale, etc. And uh, you just do that, and then you click rename, 
and uh, it names your layer correctly. So one last thing that I wanted to show you about this is uh, what if, for example, uh, you needed your assets to be a specific size? So by default, these get saved out as um, like uh, they, they get cropped, they get um, cropped to the exact size of the asset. But what if you wanted to leave a bit of a margin or you needed a particular size? So what you can do is you make a layer mask, apply it to your layer, and now it's exported like that with uh, that size. All right, so that's generate image assets. I won't repeat this because we don't have time. Uh, I will be putting these slides up and this is a link to get the add-on. It's a little bit hard to find. So, one second. Yeah. So being a good UI artist is not just about making well-designed layouts and uh, appealing graphics. It's also about having a good process that helps you work with other game devs. Um, I think having, using tools like this and having a good process will benefit your game and your team. And I hope these tools help. Thank you. <laughs> so um, we don't have time for questions, do we? This was the end. So yeah, thank you. Um, just before you go, um, you can find me online at these places. Um, you'll notice I put down a hashtag. It'd be awesome if you could share your tips and techniques for um, productivity and uh, improving your workflow on this hashtag. And you can also contact me uh, with my uh, Twitter handle. Thank you. Thank you so much.